Fournette. Fournette goes airborne. He's in. Touchdown, Jaguars. Tip and intercepted by Ramsey to close it out. It's over. The Jacksonville Jaguars have pulled off the upset of the playoffs. What is going on, everybody? It is Treeb from Treeb Talks here. Basically, to recap the 2018 season for the Jacksonville Jaguars, what we're going to be doing is giving end-of-the-year grades to all the position groups, talking about some individual players, and then at the end of the video, giving out some Player of the Year awards, even though some people probably didn't deserve it. So let us not waste any more time, ladies and gentlemen. I am Treeb from Treeb Talks, and this is the Jacksonville Jaguars end-of-the-year position grades, and players of the year. So first and foremost, we're going to be talking about the offense and starting things off with the position we usually close with, the quarterback position. So first and foremost, I want to go over the stats that Blake Bortles put up and what Cody Kessler put up. So Blake Bortles, he got 2,718 yards with 13 touchdowns and 11 interceptions with a 79 0.8 QBR. Not very good. Now, as far as Cody Kessler goes, the guy that everybody was hoping the Jags would start over Blake Bortles, finally they're like, put Cody Kessler in, he's going to be the answer. And then he ended up being like one of the only quarterbacks in the league worse than Blake Bortles. He went 709 yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions. The fact of the matter is, neither one of these quarterbacks can make any NFL throw required to be an NFL quarterback at some points in time, dude, they would throw these throws and you'd be like, what? Like, what? How do you even make that read, first of all? And how do you just throw it that bad? Like, it was a monstrosity towards, like, the end of the season to watch Blake or Cody Kessler throw the deep ball because it would never be anywhere close to the wide receiver. And then, you know, they'd even throw intermediate middle routes and then they still would barely make it to the target, and you were just sitting there wondering to yourself, why do I like this football team? The quarterback situation is just complete and utter trash, and that's just how it was. The Jaguars weren't last in passing offense, however, which I find hard to believe. They were 26th in passing uh, offense. Now, as far as the offensive line goes that affects the quarterbacks, yeah, that was a big thing, especially later on in the year when all of our offensive linemen got hurt. Um, there's pressure in both quarterbacks' face damn near every single snap. Like, it would just keep coming and coming and coming. And with that being said, it made it really hard for the quarterbacks. Now, the quarterback's grade is going to be a D-. Um, because this is Blake Bortles' last game as a Jaguar, last season, I should say, I feel dirty giving the quarterbacks an F, you know, simple. <laughs> like, I love Blake Bortles, so, you know, I won't F them. I will give them a D- minus on the season. It was hard to watch at some points. Uh, early on in the season, Blake Bortles was fun to watch, but that was early on in the season. As the season progressed, you know, things got a whole of a lot worse. So the quarterbacks getting a D- minus is definitely, definitely fair. Now, let's talk about the offensive line. The offensive line, straight up, this season, gets an F. It gets an F for a lot of reasons. There was six or seven different starting offensive lineman combinations. We were getting guys off the streets, you know, people you've never even heard about. We had Cam Rob the Cam Robinson knockoff and Corey Robinson uh, the last week of the season. Um, all of our starters, like all of our studs, went out with an injury at some point this season. Andrew Norwell, um, AJ Can, eh. Uh, Brandon Linder, you know, Jeremy Parnell, Cam Robinson, like all those guys at one point in time went down with an injury. And this was one of the stronger suits that this offense had was its offensive line. But with injuries that just piled up and piled up and piled up, it seemed like this offensive line was never going to get off the ground. So with that being said, the, it gets an F. Like the offensive line gets an F for the whole season. I think this is going to be the most improved group of 2019 because if the if the starters can play for at least the majority of the season, it's going to be already a vast improvement from last from this year. So this offensive line definitely is a spot where the Jags need to improve, but they don't really need to improve in depth or players. They really need to improve in staying healthy at that position, the offensive line. Now let us talk about the wide receivers and the tight end. So the pass catchers on the offense. 
I am going to be giving them a D plus. I was going to give them a C because there's a couple of guys that were showing out well and looked like they are going to be uh, pretty good players in the future for us that can contribute. However, the Jaguars still led the league in drops, and that's just that's too big to just overlook and give him a better grade. They led the league in drops. Keelan Cole, a guy that was the undrafted free agent, you know, everybody was talking about Mr. Keelan Cole because he was an undrafted free agent out of a D2 school, and then uh, this year he really looked like an undrafted free agent playing out of a D2 school. Uh, he went from the Jaguars leading receiver from a year ago to probably getting cut this season. I would not be surprised if Keelan Cole was cut this year, but you know, that's just me. And he was one guy that I was really upset about. You know, he took a big, big step back. However, there were guys like Blake Bell, who the Jags picked up midway through the season, and DJ Chark, who could make the roster next year and really make an impact. DJ Chark played extremely well on special teams. Um, he was a great gunner. He was good on, you know, punt, kickoff, kick return. He was on all the special teams, and he was making plays on every single one of them. And, you know, when he got in there as a receiver, sometimes he'd make a catch, but more often than not, you're kind of like, damn, you're fucking awkward, bud. You don't know how to catch a football. But I still think this guy has a future with this team and has a future as a NFL wide receiver. I think he has all the intangibles he needs to be good. I also think Blake Bell is going to stick around next year. I think that he made he didn't make big plays, but he made little plays that mattered. So I think that, you know, when they go over the tape and they look at the tight ends, I think Blake Bell is going to be one of those guys that they're like, all right, we can use this guy. This guy definitely has some playmaking ability. And I think that would be just wrong if you took that away from him. So Blake Bell is a guy that I'm excited to see if he goes and makes the roster next year. And, of course, let's talk about the Dante Moncrief contract. That sure as shit wasn't worth it, was it? I mean, like, anybody could have told you that that's not, that's not what we should have done. Because giving an uh, unproven guy 9 mil, 10 mil, however much it was, is not a good idea. Like, I should, I'm not an NFL executive, but I shouldn't have to tell you that because you are an NFL executive, you know? Like, like, why would you give Dante Moncrief that amount of money? There was just sometimes he was out there and looked like he knew he was just playing because he, playing because he just got paid and he doesn't really want to do anything, you know, just walking around the field. The effort level was incredibly low, and that's going to go down. That's going to hurt us financially because we could have put that 9 mil somewhere else this year or even last year, but I digress. D.D. Westbrook was one of the people that I would was keeping an eye on as far as Offensive Player of the Year goes. He had a fantastic season. He only had one game over 100 yards, but look... I mean, you got to look at who is throwing him the ball. You know, any game, if you're a wide receiver with Blake Bortles and Cody Kessler, if you get over 100 yards, that's impressive. Uh, he ended the season with 66 receptions, 717 yards, and five touchdowns. Now, just imagine D.D. Westbrook with a competent quarterback. I was saying this all offseason long that D.D. Westbrook has insane number one receiver potential. And I think, if anything, he showed a glimpse of it this season. Now, whether the Jags do go the veteran route and get a guy like Joe Flacco, or whether they do go in the draft and go and reach and get a guy like Dwayne Haskins. You know, if the, if D.D. Westbrook gets a competent quarterback, I think he has potential to be great. It sucks that he's in a group that has a D-plus grade, but it's not his fault. You know, he's going out there, he's doing what he needs to do uh, in order to play uh, football. You know, he was making plays when the Jags were down like 40-14. to 14. I think it was the Dallas game that he caught the ball in the back of the end zone. It might have been Tennessee on Thursday night, too. It could have been. But he totally just dragged his toes like in the back of the end zone. You know, the effort level in which G.D. Westbrook played was a level that really not a lot of Jags this year matched. You know, a lot of guys kind of looked and went out there kind of really nonchalantly like, Oh, yeah, I'm playing for the Jags. We suck. I'm not going to try. But D.D. Westbrook wasn't like that. D.D. Westbrook went out there, gave it his all, and I really think this kid has a very high ceiling and a lot of potential, and I'm excited to see what he does next year. Now, finally, we are going to be discussing the running back position, and boy, oh, boy, was that just a fucking shit show this year. Um... I don't know how much to blame it on the running backs themselves or the play calling. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about the play calling. You know, Jed, uh, Jed Fish. 
fucking Nathaniel Hackett, um, the offensive coordinator. Just the most predictable play calls. The Jags run on first and second down pass on third down. That never changed. Like, that's just what we did. Run on first and second down, letter takes a negative one run, takes a yard, and then, you know, it's third and ten, and complete, Jags punt. Like, that's just how it has been all season long. Like, <laughs> Leonard Fournette couldn't get shit going. He only played, I believe, in 23% of the offensive snaps. He ended up getting hurt. And uh, I don't think he had a game where he went over 100 yards. I think he had a couple where he went over 100 all-purpose, but not 100 total rushing yards. So with Leonard Fournette being out of the picture and him, you know, getting his, tr his contract guarantees as incentives uh, taken away from him, you know, it really looked like a guy like Corey Grant was going to emerge. But Corey Grant got injured, season-ending injury. And then, you know, TJ Yeldon stepped in. And I think TJ Yeldon, for my money, had one of the better seasons out of any job war on the team. And it sucks how we're going to do him this year. And it sucks how his season ended. He got over 1,000 yards all-purpose. Probably the most quiet over 1,000-yard all-purpose back in the league this year was T.J. Yeldon. And T.J. Yeldon averaged 4.3 yards per carry, and I'm hoping he goes to a team and he contributes because he's going to be one hell of a player in this league. If anything, he showed it with the just garbage he was handed this year, literal garbage that he was handed this year. He showed that he could be a threat and a really good player for somebody uh, for someone's offensive scheme. So T.J. Yeldon is a guy I'm really excited about. Um heading into next season to watch where he goes. I know the Jags aren't going to pick him back up, but to see where he goes and really see where his career takes him. Um, and now before we get into the grade, let's talk about the trade of all trades when the Jags traded a fifth-round pick for Carlos Hyde to barely fucking use him. That was the most pointless fucking trade I have ever seen in my entire life. And it's next year, it's going to probably be Carlos Hyde and Dave Williams. Like, those are going to be our running backs, because who knows what we're going to do with Fournette. Yeldon's gone, Grant's a free agent as well, and bam, those two are going to be our backs. The two backs we fucking didn't use all goddamn season. That's a great idea heading into 2019, a great idea. <sighs> that Carlos Hyde trade made no sense to me. It really pissed me off. But, Running backs as a whole are going to get a C. I think Leonard dragged the running backs down, but TJ Yeldon really brought him up. Like I said, he had one hell of a 2018 campaign, and wherever he goes next, I cannot wait to see uh, what he does. Now let us talk about the offense's final grade. Now there was a lot of injuries. There was a lot of bad play. There was a bit of good play. You know, D.D. Westbrook and TJ Yeldon are like, Tree, are you going to give us... A little leeway to improve our grade, but we're not really. So the grade overall for this offense is going to be a solid D. Um, this offense was supposed to be so much more with this new offensive line we got with Leonard Fournette running behind him. It was supposed to be just the biggest power run offense of all time. But then we realized we're living in an era where young quarterbacks are basically it. Like that's what you need to win is a young quarterback and the power run game is a thing of the past, and it sucks because I don't think Doug Marone is going to be able to let that go, but we will see uh, heading into next year. But as far as this whole offense goes, a D on the season is really fair, probably the biggest disappointment of 2018. Now let us talk about the defense. The defense still was an elite unit this year, uh, though there were some guys that took some steps back. And some guys that, you know, played questionable. Um, I still think overall this defense did finish in the top ten. This defense is still something we could build around. And there's still some guys that we really need to lock down for a long, long time. I'll get into that uh, in a little bit. So first and foremost, we're going to be breaking down the linebackers. The first three weeks of the season, these were the guys that, you know, you could never say a bad word about. As the season progressed, the only people you could say bad words about were the linebackers. Telvin Smith took the biggest step back out of any player all season long. I don't care. Whenever there was a pass his way, if he was in pass coverage, the guy would catch it or he'd be fucking five yards down the field and Telvin's five yards behind him, like not doing his job. However, he did lead the league in tackles, so in that, I mean, lead the team in tackles, so in that aspect, I mean, he had a good season. Miles Jack has always had it, will always have a good season. There's just not much I have to complain about as far as Miles Jack goes. There was never really one particular time in pass coverage where I was like, oh, Miles Jack, you're bad. 
you know, but I do think that we need to get a guy more like Puzz. I'm not one of those guys that says Puzz was a legend, you know. I think he was a great player and what he did for the community. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't be anything without Puzz, but we really need a true middle linebacker because Miles Jack just isn't a true middle linebacker. He's a talented cat. But as far as being a true field general middle linebacker, that's not who Miles Jack is, and it really showed this season. It was the first year that he filled that role, and there's a lot of people saying give him a second year. But every time we say give somebody a second year, it always ends up biting us in the ass, and that's kind of what, I, what I'm with with Dave Caldwell and Doug Marone. It's like, why give them a second chance when we have shown that second chances, at least for our organization, aren't they don't work. Like, you know, we'll give guys five years and they'll only win 12 games, you know. Like, there's just no point in giving second chances, I don't think. But as far as these linebackers go, they're going to get a C on the year. Uh, Telvin Smith, like I said, did take the biggest step back. But, you know, young guys stepped in. Um, Leon Jacobs before, I think he got hurt. I don't know. I know DeLuca came in and played a little bit more towards the end of the season. But... Um, Leon Jacobs, uh, he played all right. He didn't play terrible. He didn't play awful. You know, he, he was one of the people that got stiff-armed by Derrick Henry in that 99-yard touchdown run. But like I said, I think he did all right, too. And I think these linebackers did just well enough to earn a C grade. Now, with that being said, let's talk about the defensive line. The defensive line uh, was a big bright spot this year. In 2018, um, Yannick Ngakwe got nine sacks, and Clayus Campbell got ten. So it is a step back from where they were last year. Uh, Clayus, of course, broke the Jaguars sack record last year, getting 14 and a half, and this year getting ten. That's only a four-sack difference, and if you just get double-digit sacks in this league, you're a great player. And that's what Clayus Campbell is, is a great player. So, you know, he went out there, he did his job. Um, really was a leader of the team. I think when the team was really in its deepest and darkest point, I think Calais Campbell was the guy to really take them out of it. Um, Yannick Ngakwe as well. A lot of people said he struggled all year, but damn, dude, I think he's he made a couple of plays, man, and I think that he had one of the better 2018s out of anybody on this roster. Uh, you've seen a couple of guys that are probably going to be playing their last game, Marcel Darius, Malik Jackson, um, and then you've seen guys that came in that really seemed like they were incompetent, really shouldn't have been a first-round draft pick like Taven Bryant. Taven Bryant didn't get his first NFL sack until Week 17. The Jaguars didn't really trust him to play a lot this year, which just doesn't make any fucking sense to me. Let the guy go wild, like play him more. You know, if you spent a first-round draft pick on a guy, you should probably play him more. That's all I'm saying. The only reason that a player should play the like the amount of times that Taven Bryan played is if you're a quarterback. And like your quarterback that's starting in front of you has been a bet for so long and is obviously just trying to show you the raise before you take over. But you don't do that on the defensive line. Like you can still rotate in and get him some playing time, but you know, as a whole I don't think he did too great. Um, I think this team did kind of regress just a little bit in rushing the passer. However, I think they did get better at stopping the run. You've seen Calais Campbell making some plays on the run. You're just like, holy shit, this guy's football instincts are off the charts, and it really showed this season. Um, as for a final grade for this defensive line, we're going to be giving up a B plus. I think uh, Taven Bryant's kind of holding him back from getting an A. Um, and there's a couple of guys that regressed. But, you know, Yannick and Gawkway and Calais Campbell are two guys that hopefully this franchise will have for a long time. And it'll be one of the better uh, pass rushing duos in the league. Now, last but certainly not least, we're going to be talking about the secondary that a lot of people have a really inspired and passionate opinion about. But I think y'all should slow your roll. I don't understand. I, I don't understand the grief where people are like, AJ Bouye played like shit this year, cut him, fucking trade him, you know? Like, do you know how hard it is? Look at these teams, like, in the NFL. You look at their number one corner, look at their number two corner. You know, like, there's no way, especially with you're still on the contract that we get rid of AJ Bouye because that's having two fucking good corners. Jalen Ramsey and AJ Bouye. Do not get rid of A.J. Boye because he compliments Jalen Ramsey so fucking well. And if you don't think that, you are literally an idiot. Like, that's just, that's all there is to it. If you think we should get rid of A.J. Boye, you are literally an idiot. I'm not saying he had a great 2018 by any means, but I'm saying that he is a perfect number two corner. And he would be a number one corner in a lot of different teams. You know, he does his job. 
The nickel corner is still kind of up for grabs. It sucks seeing Aaron Colvin being a healthy scratch in their playoff game. He didn't get a lot of playing time uh, for Houston. I think if he should come back to Jacksonville because he really played that nickel corner position well. DJ Hayden, he had an all right season. I think he did reel in one interception this year, which is cool. But I would still rather have Aaron Colvin. I don't think the uh, chances are likely for Aaron Cor Colvin to come back. Um, so, you know, as far as corners go, they did fine. They did their job. Like, they did exactly what they needed to do. And I think people just need to slow down on the hate and realize how lucky we are to have two good corners. N not a lot of team in the NFL has one good corner. Like, to have two good corners, that's really good. Like, you just, you guys need to calm down and accept that fact. Now, as far as the safeties go, the Jags cut Barry Church midseason, a guy that a lot of Jags fans just did not like uh, as the season started. When you know, for good reason, he, he was not playing good. You know, he, that's, that's all the reason you really need to not like a guy, and I guess uh, he did do that. He did not play well. Uh, guys like Ronnie Harrison came in, and before he got hurt, he was balling out, and he looked like he had a future here. Uh, Deshaun Gibson had an all right season. He's another guy that... I would keep an eye on as far as cuts go. I would not be surprised if we ended up cutting him and tried to get a guy in the draft to match up with Ronnie Harrison, but we will see uh, how that goes. Now, the secondary as a whole is going to get the highest grade. I'm going to give him an A. Maybe controversial, but I don't care. It's my channel. I think that the secondary played better than any position group on the field in 2018. Now it is time for the defense's final grade, and like I said, it's hard for me to give these guys a low grade because they still finish top 10 in the NFL. So with that being said, I'm going to be giving this Jaguar defense on the season a B plus. Um, last year would have gotten A plus for me. Uh, this year, you know, like I said, there were some regression steps, some step backs, but you know, not enough for me to completely say this defense is average. This defense is okay. This defense is still elite, and it's still a top 10 defense in the league. You just need to put somebody on the offense that can score some points. Now it is the moment you have all been waiting for, the Jaguars Players of the Year as far as special teams, offense, and defense goes. I know I didn't break down the special teams. I kind of forgot as I was recording. But the special award for special teams Player of the Year goes to Josh Lambeau. I can't tell you how refreshing it is to have a good kicker in this league, especially after watching the Bears playoff game with Cody Parkey. Like, I can't tell you how good it feels to be to have Josh Lambeau. Actually, if you're, like, balls deep in this video and you're still watching, Colton gave me a Josh Lambeau jersey for Christmas, so everybody in the comment section, shout out to Colton for the Josh Lambeau jersey. Uh, that was badass, but... Uh, like I said, Josh Lambeau, definitely deserving of special teams. Player of the year. Guys also considered DJ Chark a really good gunner this year. D.D. Westbrook uh, had the punt return touchdown as well. But the consistency of Josh Lambeau could not be matched. Now, for defensive player of the year, we're going to be giving it to Calais Campbell. I think Calais Campbell was a defensive leader from the start. Like I said, he racked up double-digit sacks again this year in 2018. And he's a leader on the team. He's a leader off the field as well. Just a great, terrific overall guy and somebody that you want on your football team and I think well-deserved of uh, defensive MVP for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, finally, the hard one. The one no one knows what I'm going to pick. The offensive player of the year is... TJ Yeldon. When I did my position grades, you know, recaps for, for games this season, the player that won the most offensive MVPs was TJ Yeldon. So it would be a disservice to not give TJ Yeldon the offensive player of the year in his final year in Jacksonville, which really, really sucked, but like I said, had probably the quietest over 1,000 yards from scrimmage uh, season out of any back ever. So with that, we are thankful that you gave the offense the little spark that it had, TJ Yeldon. And that was my Jaguars end of the season position grades and players of the year. What did you guys think? Leave your comments down below. Don't forget to check the links down below as well. You can like me on Facebook at Troop Talks. Follow me on Twitter at Trevon Pixley or follow me on Instagram at Trayvon Pixley. Also, if you're feeling so generous, you can go ahead and donate on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash 
Shreve Talks. Also, if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button, click the bell icon so you get notified every single time I drop a new video. I drop new content on this channel six days a week. Ain't nobody out working me. Those are just straight facts. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and as always, you guys have a great day.